Uh, today I'm going to have um, Minister Kathy just come for just a few minutes. Um, we have the communion and so many things to do, but I ask you to come just to share two, two special events that I think uh, really bring out the history of this church and it also accentuates so much of what the Lord has done since then and even now. And I think it would help you to just appreciate how God was with us from the very beginning, how this whole thing got started. And so, Ms. Kathy, would you come? Because really, she's probably uh, the oldest uh, member of this, of this church uh, from the very beginning. She said she was there at Bedford Avenue, which you were there for about, about a year or so. So that makes her yeah, pretty much, I don't know of anyone else here that's, uh, that has anything on her on that one. <laughs> okay, all right. Good morning, church. Here in obedient, I was asked to give two testimonies. I could give many and many and many and many the things that my eyes have seen and the ears have heard. This church started on prayer. And Bedford Avenue, Pastor Ronnie said, I can't remember what, 1975, Bedford Avenue. We used to pray there. Then we moved to 20, 26th Street, then to Utica Avenue. Now we're going to give two quick testimony that my eyes have seen. Now, first of all, I'm going to give the second one first. I, you know, my last daughter born in, born at Kings County. After the child was born healthy, doctor, everybody in two days time when I'm ready to go home the doctor come and tell me, oh Miss Marlon I don't think you could take the baby home the baby have a heart murmur I said excuse me he said we cannot let you go home with the baby I said I am going home with my baby so the social worker everybody I said look I dressed my baby went downstairs get the cab and I left by the time I get home, the phone ringing off the hook. Social worker, everybody calling. But I don't have my plan and I know, you know, she cannot have no heart mama. So that day I'm telling you, rain, thunder, lightning. When about three o'clock I said to my husband, could you go outside? And then I dressed in the baby. I said, could you go outside and stop a car for me. I don't tell him I'm going to the church. He said, excuse me? He said, where are you going in the rain? I, and you're taking the baby? I said, yes. He said, I'm not going and get no car for you. I said to him, I said, if you don't go, I will have to go with her. Make it worse. Oh, he quickly get up and he went to get the car. That time I don't call Pastor Leakey and I told her I want to speak with her at the church. I didn't tell her what I was doing. She said, um. So she said, okay, I'll meet you there. She was very obedient. The minute time I said that, she said, okay, I'll meet you there. So I know I got to hurry up now. When I get outside, I got in the car, sit down, and I'm thinking now. She said, oh. By the time I get there, she was at the church already waiting for me. When I got up the stairs with the baby, she said, I said, that's why I didn't tell you I was bringing her. Because I know you would have stopped me. She said, what happened? And I told her what happened. She said, come over here. By the time we rest the baby on the altar, somebody coming up the stairs, Sister Millie. She said, Sister Millie, what you doing here in this rain? She said, okay, myself. Pastor Leakey and Sister Millie's. It have to be God sent Sister Millie because nobody called her. She didn't know we was there. She come, drop the baby on the altar. Pray, Pastor Leakey didn't forget. Drop a prayer on that baby. 
She said, okay, we're going to go home now. Um, she's fine. And don't let nobody tell you nothing else. I said, no, nobody from the start. You think they're going to do it now? No. By the time I say so, I get back home, the social worker was calling. And I said, look, my baby is fine. I had to take her back to Kings County to the pediatrician. I took her to the pediatrician now looking at me now. What are they talking about? There is no heart, mama. The baby is fine. So I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. She said, they said the baby have a heart, mama. But I don't see that. She said, okay. Miss Marlon, I'm going to just write the report. You could leave. I left. And from today now, Alicia is what, 41? 42, my December? 42? 41. Never have a hard mama. When, come out, go to school. Right now, she has two degree. Hard mama left. Then the second one, Lord, you're all going to die for this one. We was in the basement. And we always, when you're going to the basement, you're always thinking, what's going to happen tonight? Because a miracle always happen in the basement. Pastor Ronnie, is that so? Every Wednesday something happening. So we sit in there singing and Pastor Lee, I'm looking around and I saw Brother Ashley coming down with this big woman on his back. And I'm like, what's going on here tonight? When he came in, he put us sit down on the chair Pastor Leak, you know, but apparently he must have called her, so she expecting this lady coming, but we didn't know what's going on. I never heard a prayer like that. Pastor Leakey laid down some prayer, and that woman anoint her. And let me tell you, that woman didn't walk for about over a year. She got up and walked out from the basement. Pastor Ronnie, am I saying it right? She walked out and, and from that day on, she was a busy body walking up and down. And you see, that song they sing about the miracle is coming back. My faith, my faith believes it. My ears have heard prophecy. And God's word will not return to him void. So love fellowship, be encouraged because there's a lot more things that happen. I have seen it. I've heard it. I, I, I think it's only um, Pastor Ronnie is here that could speak. We heard it all and we saw it all. So love fellowship, be encouraged. Our miracle is coming. Kenny, I love those two songs this morning. Yeah, that was excellent. How many know that worship was excellent? I mean, it was just beyond excellent. As a matter of fact, I, was, I uh, saw Minister Carl, and I said, Mr. Carl, what are you doing there? You belong up there. But he says he's a little bit under the weather, so that's okay, and we understand that. But let me just quickly be going to uh, the fact that we're celebrating this anniversary over two legs. We're going to do it today, and we're going to do it again on next Sunday. Um, and so let's just, I just want to take the time to kind of explain an anniversary, because sometimes, you know, we, we have misconceptions about an anniversary, or we have conceptions that are just traditional from you know, growing up in a particular home or in a particular place. But, but first of all, let me just say this. An anniversary is actually an annual celebration of a date or time that was special. So, for example, when husbands and wives celebrate an anniversary, they're celebrating a date and time that was special for them at a particular time. And they celebrate that every single year 
as long as the Lord, you know, spares their life. Because that's an event that they remember, that's an event that they cherish, and that's an, uh, uh, an event that they ponder and think about because it was absolutely special. So, you know, so people don't celebrate anniversaries if there's nothing to celebrate. You only celebrate anniversary if there's something special behind it. And, um, and 43 years ago, uh, a woman named Nellie Leakey, which is my mom, started what is today called, what was back then called the UICC. Uh, and that was United International Christ Crusaders. And, um, and it was a missionary group or an evangelistic group that was created for the purpose of bringing Christ to people in whatever city, whatever street, whatever land they were in. And so that missionary group or that evangelistic group actually went to, um, in, its, in, in its infancy, went to uh, Trinidad, it went to Barbados, it went to Guyana, and it went to Suriname. That was the first big missionary trip. But before it did all that, it went into Prospect Park, Brooklyn. We had the bandstand there. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of people. We, we, were, uh, we were at um, what used to be Albee Square, which is downtown Brooklyn now. Uh, we were at uh, Times Square. Uh, around 46th Street. I mean, where, where it was, the streets were so packed that the police had to come to direct traffic. Because, uh, you know, my sisters and I, we had a band and, and some others that were a part of it, and we were singing and, and praising the Lord, and, you know, we just brought the gospel to the street, and people came from everywhere. You know, Times Square is just generally filled anyway. And so, but when they heard the music and they heard all this stuff going on and they saw these young people, you know, 15 and 16 and 17, they just, they were like, what is going on here? You know, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so, and so that's, and so that's how that whole thing was. It was all about bringing Christ to people at whatever level we were able to do it. It, it was a group um, that basically just had late teens in it. Uh, people in their early 20s and maybe two or three people who were in their early 30s at the time, like Minister Kathy and, and maybe one or two others. And the group was built, as she said, on the foundation of prayer. This church was built on the foundation of prayer. But, you know, usually when you go to a church and you see prayer meeting going on and you look at the people who are there, they're usually older people. You know, people who have been in the faith a while, you know, just older people. Because, because older people usually understand the significance and importance of prayer. So that's why they're there. But what was unusual about UICC was that it wasn't older people you saw there. You saw people who are 15, 16, and 17, and 18, and 19, and in their early 20s, crying out before God. I mean, they, were filled, they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so they spoke in tongues, and, and, they, and they would cry out to the Lord. And so it was interesting that as a result of that, and because of the faith and the simplicity of these young people, miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles happened. It's nothing, it's, listen, there's something about seeing a miracle for yourself. When you see a miracle for yourself, trust me, it's a whole different thing. And I saw those miracles. I saw them right there. I saw this woman who the doctor, she was pregnant, and the doctor told her, you know, this ain't going to happen. And I remember her coming to the basement with those young people, my cousin Ricky and a bunch of others that were there. And they, and they brought her. She brought herself. And then they brought her to the front. And when my mom prayed for her, now check this out, now, laid, laid hands on her, she fell pregnant on her back. And, of course, we, we're all saying, oh, my God. Because she was already, the doctors had already said that she wasn't going to be able to have this baby, that it was not going to happen. And now she comes to a prayer meeting, and she falls on her back 
in her condition. But I want you to know, here, let me give you the story. Let me give you the end of the story. The end of the story is that she ended up having that baby, and that baby went on to become a police officer. I want you to know that God is absolutely real. Now, the interesting thing is that this, this group sort of, you know, evolved um, into a church under the encouragement and blessings of Pastor Simbler from the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And he said, and I paraphrase uh, what he said to my mom. He says, listen, Sister Leakey, you have started something that's so special with these young people. You know, the missionaries, that you, the missionary trips that you, that you took, the, the, the crusades that you had on our own streets of New York. He says, you need to do something with these young people. Start a church with them. And so that's how we transitioned from Brooklyn Tabernacle to what is today is called Love Fellowship. And just to make to put a note there, somewhere during all that's going on there, I fell in love with someone named Marcia Leakey, <laughs> sitting right over there. So we got married right, actually a year after we were in the building, in the 837 Utica Avenue building. And you know, one of the strangest things about this 837 Utica Avenue building that ju I just heard recently, I didn't know about this because I didn't know he was even there. Kenny said to me that he visited there when he was a teenager. I said, what? Here's a crazy thing about it. This is like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Who knew 20, 25 years ago that he would become the song leader of this church 25 years later. You know, and so, like I said, I, 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 that, that just, when he mentioned that to me, he was just talking to me in, in passing, and I said, you were there? I said, where, where were you? <laughs> uh, and so, but you know what? The prayer meetings transitioned from the basement to the second floor of 837 Utica Avenue. And that's where, and it's funny, how this church has always had a youth thing going on. Is that added to the ones that were already there, some new ones came in. Some young people, young people came in. Like, you, you know, Minister Ingrid back then, she was about maybe 18, 19. Um, you know, we had Minister Carl, who may have been about 22, 20, no, maybe 23, 24 at the time. Leslie, uh, you know who Leslie is. Um, you know, uh, Minister Karim, of course, who's sitting right over here. Uh, um, and just so many young people. N I don't know if you remember Natalie. A lot of you remember Natalie. Natalie was just, she was just, you know, she was just gifted to, to evangelize. And she was gifted in prayer. I mean, and so, and then my cousin Ricky and uh, my, my cousin Ethel and, and um, just so many others that just came in and they were a part. My sisters, Laverne, Lorma, um, uh, Debbie, uh, Lisa, because Lisa was a ba baby, really. Um, you know, and, and my brother John, who was also a baby as well. But, you know, and, but I'm saying to you, when you walked into 837 Utica Avenue, the altar was completely filled. If you got there late, you couldn't get on that altar. Because it was, and you know what? Again, unusual. It wasn't filled with older people. It was filled with younger people crying out to God on their faces before God, interceding before God, speaking in a heavenly language before God. And the presence of God was like amazing. You know, and, and then I think about uh, that as it was through all that was going on, Eon came in. You know, he came in through the evangelistic efforts that we were making right there on the streets of Utica Avenue. And, uh, and such a wonderful brother and someone that I've, I've learned to treasure in the Lord uh, uh, just over the years has always stuck by us in everything that we did or, or, or did. Um, you know, we have, we have so many wonderful people that, that are still here today from that particular era. 
Celeste, of course, you know, the, we, she's the on aging person. She never ages, right? She just kind of, if you look at her, a picture of her 20 years ago, she's kind of the same, you know? Um, and so, and so, and so, but the thing is this, is that, is that that prayer meeting, the, listen to me, if you don't know the presence of God, well, that means you don't know the presence of God because the presence of God is real. But the Bible says that God's presence descends upon us when we give him the praise that's due to his name. So today, many of these young people today, you know where they are? They're pastors, they're ministers, they're chaplains, they're spiritual leaders, they're worship leaders, they're youth leaders, they're all kinds of things. In other states, in other countries, and even here in the state of New York, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some names. Pastor Lincoln uh, Fritz from Brooklyn Tabernacle. These people weren't pastors back then, but I'm just showing you how God use this ministry to, to, li to literally birth these wonderful people, men and women of God. Uh, Pastor Higgins, of course, which you all know. Uh, Pastor Maggie, which uh, she's in Far Rockaway. Pastor Alberto, which of course you know. Pastor Deborah John, which some of you don't, most of you don't know. Pastor Sharon, who has been here several times. Uh, Pastor Parchment, my best friend. Uh, you know, when I got married. Uh, Pastor Roland Grant, of course, you've seen him. Pastor Roger Johnson, which you don't know. Pastor Anthony Wrong, who has, who has been such, who was such a blessing to UICC and, has, and went on to help build other ministries. I mean, literally help build other ministries. Pastor Wally Best, which a lot of you know. Uh, Minister Warren, which a lot of you know, who is in, in Georgia. Um, and then we go on to People who are deacons in our church that are not that have gone on, lived in other other states. That deacon Leslie Bailey, you know, you know, she became a deacon, right? At some point, she was a deacon. Uh, um, then there was uh, one one of our praise and worship leaders, Pat Sinclair. Some of you remember her. Uh, Evelyn Holmes, another one. Uh, Ozzy, as well, who became a deacon in our church, as well. Clark, who ended up getting married to Leslie. In the same church, by the way. And, um, and then in recent times, uh, you know, we have people like my wife, who we call her Pastor Marcia, Minister Kathy, Minister Karim, who's here, Minister Roger, Minister Wendy, Minister Mary, and on and on. Then we have the deacons, Deacon Leela, um, uh, Deacon Carol, Deacon Jennifer, Deacon Hillary. Uh, then we have those who are in training for deaconship, like like Cleo, Mary Ann, Kenny, Connie, and, and, and some others. And then we've also had some great Christian workers like Rolanda. Rolanda was always so strategic in so many things that we did. She'd always call me and give me little things and says, okay, have we thought about this? Have we thought about that? Um, uh, of course, Kenny, I can't say it a, a second time, but Kenny, you know how much, how much of a blessing you've been. Um, uh, and then, you know, I think about Deborah Seaton, as, I, as I'm thinking about this past uh, Friday as we went to Carol's mother's funeral and I saw her two daughters there helping out. And, I, and it just brought me back to say, I mean, because their mother, Deborah, was a blessing to this church. I mean, she was there every step of the way in everything that we did. Um, and then, you know, and, then, and, and the beat goes on. That's all I got to say about that. And the beat goes on. Some of you know that song, right? Don't lie. Yeah, I know you know it. Um, again, I'm thankful to all my sisters, Laverne, Lorma, uh, Debbie, Lisa, uh, my sister Kim, and also my brother John, um, and also my children. How could I forget my own children? You know, I mean, they were the ones who did the praise and worship. You know, after that transition, people transitioned, they were the ones who took over that. Uh, you know, Ronnie and uh, Sean on the... Um, on the keyboards, and, uh, and Lauren, uh, again, praise and worship, and Justin, praise and worship. And, of course, my cousin Jay in, in, in Staten Island, and, of course, my cousin Ricky, who's, who's passed, and my cousin Ethel Dean, and, of course, my Aunt Audrey, my Aunt Merle. My Aunt Audrey's still alive, I mean, and she's been a blessing to me. I've gotten to le learn a lot of things about our family history just from her. Um, 
But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is called the ecclesia in the Greek, is a body just like any human body. You know, the Bible says that the, that the body of Christ is like the human body. In other words, it operates the same way. It has the same sort of components. In a human body, you have a lot of, a lot of members. You have the heart. You have the nose. You have the ears. You have the kidneys. You have uh, the arteries. You have so many members in your body that makes you function. Uh, you have the brain. Because without these parts, you know, you, be, you, wouldn't, be a, you wouldn't be a body. If you, if you were just a, a physical shell, but you have no heart, you have no kidney, you have no liver, you have no, you have no brain, then really what you really are are a corpse. Because, because a body has to be made up of members. It, it has to be made up that function to make that body successful, to make that body healthy, to make that body prosperous. And, and so it's the same thing with us. We, the Bible says that we're a body and that in the church, you can't be, see, a lot of people say they're part of the church, but they, they, they really, they, it's a misconception, Minister Carl, that you know what it is? They really don't understand what the church is. They think the church, they think the church more as a place a place that you go to, like to go to worship or to go to, go to, or go to see something special. That's how they see the church. But Jesus never said the church was that. The, ch the church is not a building. The church is not a person. The church is a body. And you know what it is? It's the body of Christ. Jesus is the head and we are what? We are the members of the body. So just like you, as I'm looking at you, all of you have a head. And so your head controls what? Every single part of your body. So without a head, what would happen to the parts of your body? They'll die. They, very good. They die. They would be, they, they'll be non-functioning. And so, and so when we think of the, of the church, always remember that it is a body with Jesus Christ as the head and we as members of that body. And so that's why 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says... For the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form how many bodies? They form one body. So it is with Christ. So it is with the ecclesia. So it is with the church. And so, and Jesus in Ephesians 5, 27 says, this is what it says. It says, He's coming back for a church without what? Spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a church. So, for example, if you just, if you're just, you know, if you just uh, uh, visit a church or if you just come for events of a church, if you don't belong to a local church somewhere, you don't have to belong to this one, but you got to belong to some local church somewhere. Where you're committed to that church, you're committed to its prayer meeting, you're committed to its Bible study, you're committed to its men's fellowship, you're committed to the women's fellowship, you're committed to its children's ministry. You got to belong to one of its, its church, one of the local churches. When Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, says, I will build my, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, what he was talking about was local churches that he would build all across the world. The first local church was a church uh, uh, in Jerusalem. Remember the church in Jerusalem? It, we call it the early church, or some people call it the first century church. That was the very first church that, that Jesus established. That was the very first local church, and the Bible says in Acts 2.42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and teachings, in the breaking of bread, holy communion, prayer, and the word. And so, and so the point I'm making is that the reason why that church is a model church is because God used it to show us how the church is to function. The people there were in prayer. They were in Bible study. They, take, they took Holy Communion. They, they evangelized. They worked together as a body to build that particular local church. 
And, and, and the one thing that happens when the people of God come together, there's a divine presence of God that shows up. Unlike television, unlike YouTube, unlike in your living room and in your kitchen and all that, there is no presence of God like the presence of God that comes where two or three are gathered together in his name. 18, Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Why? Because remember, the church is, the, the, the word church, or ecclesia, means, means a body of called out ones. So you're called out, she's called out, he's called out, she's called out, he's called out, he's called out, he's called out. And even though Jesus called us out individually, he placed us into what? Into one local body. So that we function under his headship. And so, and so as a result, uh, it says here, wherever two or three of my people are gathered together, there I am in the midst. I want you to know that there's, a, there's a, such a presence of God that comes when the people of God come together to worship, to work together for his kingdom. You know, Psalms 22 verse 3 says this, and I'm sure you've heard the scripture. It's a very popular scripture. God inhabits what? The praises of his people. Check this out. What does it say? God inhabits the praises of his people. It's amazing to think that God in all of his fullness, that God in all of his glory inhabits and literally comes and dwells in our praise of him when we come together. That somehow God just finds a Simone, and he finds a Salise, and he finds a, a Kenny, and he finds a Minister Carl, and he finds a Minister Captain, and he finds a, all of us. And when he finds us together, the Bible says he, his presence is amplified. Because remember, God dwells in us as individuals, but there's a certain anointing that comes. Hallelujah. There's a certain advantage of his presence that comes when we come together. That's why the Bible says, pray one for another that you might be what? That you might be healed. Now, and so God expects us in the local church to celebrate every year that he's kept us together. Every year that he's kept the doors open so that someone else uh, that's not here today, that's, that's here today, but that wasn't here there back then, what, is able to come and say, you know what? Thank God that these doors are open. Because you know what? If, if, if it wasn't, it's like we said, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, if it hasn't been for love fellowship in the lives of so many people, where would they be? That's how good God is. And that's how it is. You know what? Uh, and we celebrate the deliverances of, of, that God has given to us together. You know, we celebrate all of our deliverances. I mean, I may not have been delivered from this or that or the other, but I've been delivered from other things. But we celebrate all of our deliverances. You know, some people, it, some people that are in this church were, were delivered from alcohol. Some were delivered from drugs. Some were delivered from sexual sins of fornication and adultery. There were some who were delivered from, from medical conditions, migraine, headache, knees, knee conditions, cancer, lung disease, and you just name it. But guess what? God did it. In every single person that's sitting in this room, God did it. What has God done for you? You ought to reminisce and think about what God has done for you. You know, and I also think of the fact that so many of our children are blessed. I, I heard Mr. Kathy talking about her daughter, Alicia. I mean, that little girl was supposed to be dead 41 years ago. But you see what God did? Through this ministry, she found it. And then at a particular point in time, there was a crisis. And God brought her right to the place where her daughter would be healed. You know, let me say something to you. You remember the story of, of, of Elijah? You see, it's not enough just to go anywhere. Or, you know, some people talk about church like, yeah, 
it's almost like going to a, like a sports club. You know, I, uh, if I don't go to this one, I go to that one. Not the church. When God saves us, he knows because he's an omniscient God. You know, he knows exactly where he's going to place you. And so he knows exactly where some of your blessings are going to come from. He knows exactly where some of your healings are going to come from. He knows exactly where some of your connections and favor will come from. And so if you just randomly find yourself anywhere, you're going to miss the blessings because God orchestrated the blessing to find you where he placed you. Come on, somebody. And so, and so it's important to realize that it's not an arbitrary thing to just, you know, well, today I'll, I'll drop off at, you know, at Avenue D and, next, and maybe next week I'll go to Clarendon Road. No, you have to know where God has placed you. And so, and God has given us great jobs, great salaries, educational degrees. We have people here who have double masters, um, uh, good cars, beautiful apartments, and all the, all the things that, that the ordinary person lives for. Because when you think about the fact, and he's answered multiple prayers. Come on, somebody. He's answered multiple prayers. And so, and so that's why we celebrate, we commemorate, we cherish that which God has done. And how are we here for 43 years? Let me just ask that question. And how are we here for 43 years? You know, it's all been... The, the following, the goodness of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord, the kindness of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord, the favor of the Lord. It's all, but you know, at the end of the day, it's all the Lord. The Lord did it. The Lord did it. The Lord did it. The Lord did it. And so, to, and, and so we say to him what? Be the glory. Because he's the one who did all this for us. Yeah. Um, over the years, God blessed members of this congregation to work in the financial district uh, of, of, of Wall Street. You know, people right here in our church uh, uh, work with mayors and other prominent officials. There are people from this church who, who are managers and as supervisors of major companies right here in this church. People with m multiple degrees. You know, we have nurses, we have teachers, we have loan officers, we have police officers like Minister Carl. Uh, we have business owners. We have authors like Minister Karim. You know, he wrote a book, right? You better get it. <laughs> and, and Rolanda, you know, Rolanda also both, has written several, several books. In over 43 years of our history, we've had some of the best and brightest. You know, for those of you, of course, like, because uh, the only ones who remember this would be Celeste, Minister Wendy, my wife, uh, Minister Mary, and uh, can't see, Minister Quinn, probably you remember. You know, we, you, you ever heard of the 700 Club? Well, at one point, there was, there was a man named Ben Kinchlow, who was the co-host of the 700 Club. Guess what? He was at Love Fellowship. Carlton Pearson used to have something called the Azusa Street Revival. Guess what? He was at Love Fellowship. These are prominent people in their day. Uh, Jesse Dixon, we had him at Brooklyn College when he just, it, he came a slightly after Andre Crouch or right about the, towards the end of Andre Crouch. And when he came in, I mean, he just took the, 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 the Christian world by storm. We had him right there. And I'm also thinking we had that Danny Bill Hall, but I just can't remember that too well. But so, but, but, so he came. We had Vicki Winans from the Winans family right there, right there. And my sisters and I were in concert with the Winans when they had their first concert here in New York City. I want you to know we have a lot to celebrate. <laughs> and we have a lot to give God thanks for. And so many more things. I mean, as Kathy says, we could never take the time. If we took the time today to talk about all these things, we'd be here a couple of days. Now, you know, the Jews at every feast, and there are three feasts, but I, I don't want to, I plan to go into that, but I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But there were, there, there are three, there are seven actual feasts that the Jews celebrate. And really what, the, what those feasts are, they're anniversaries, because they celebrate them every single year. And, and at every feast, anniversary, one of the things that had to accompany the anniversary 
It's honoring God, but not just honoring him with praise and worship like we did, not just honoring him with testimonies like Minister Kathy did, but honoring him with that which he's blessed us with. You know, the Bible says, honor the Lord with the substance and with all thine increase, so shall your barns be what? Filled with plenty. And so they were to bring a special offering to the temple, listen to me now, to the temple where they belong. They were to bring that special offering to the place that they were celebrating this anniversary. Uh, you know, one of the big celebrations of the Jews is the Passover. And you know, the Passover is a celebration of their emancipation from Egypt. And, and not just that. The reason it's called the Passover is because that was also when God sent a death angel to kill the firstborn of every family. But, but because of God's grace, the Bible says that when the, the death angel came over the houses of the Jews, the blood was, was at their post. And the Bible says that he passed over them. But you know what the Bible says? But all through Egypt, there was an airy cry of mothers and fathers who were crying because their, 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 their firstborn was just killed, just died because of the death angel. But in the camp of the righteous, in the camp of God's people, guess what? They were celebrating the goodness of God. And you know the interesting thing that I didn't realize? That 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 event happened just about a day before they exited. It happened just about a day before they exited Egypt. That's why when they went to Pharaoh and says, give us your jewels. Bling bling for some of you who don't know what that is. He said, give us all your bling bling, you know, because we're getting ready to go out of here. And you know, what, you know what Pharaoh says? Get out of here, please. Get out of here. And take all the jewels and take all the bling bling and take all the gold and so on. And, and, and they exited under that traumatic atmosphere. Of course, you know what happened with Pharaoh. Like about a day or so later, he said, what did I do? And then he, he, what he did, he got his soldiers on horses to chase them down to try to get back the bling bling. And so, and so the point I'm making is that they would bring an offering to the temple that they belong to. Not the temple outside there, not the temple anywhere else, but the temple they belong to. And the reason for that is because they were saying, you know what? This is, a, this is an offering to thank you for all that you've done. This is an offering to remember the fact that if it had not been for your presence with me, I may not be here right now. That operation may not have gone successful. That doctor may not have known exactly what to do. Because at the end of the day, and I've been in, you know, and as you know that my recent history has had medical, 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 medical situations all the time and being in the hospital. And one of the things I realize is that many times, you know, we don't understand that doctors are just human beings. And they don't really have all the answers that you think they have. And sometimes when they're, when they're brutally honest with you, you realize and say, oh, oh, God, I need you. I don't need Dr. Kim. I need you. Because if Dr. Kim blows it, I know you can handle it. You can, you can take control of it. And so, and so, and so we, that's, why, that's why we do that. That's why God told him, you remember me in this particular way. You know, to, for, for giving you a place where you can come and you can hear the word of God. A place where you can find brothers and sisters who will love you and, and care for you and call you on the phone and, uh, and, 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 and are willing to spend time with you, uh, even though they have busy schedules too. Uh, and some of you, are, you know, you've received the calls. Why? Because these are people who love the Lord. They love the Lord. And they take special time from their busy schedules. Some of them are married. They have children. They have parents who are sick. They have all kinds of stuff going on. But you know what? They love the Lord that much. You know, it's funny. And I'm kind of going to kind of sum summarize everything by saying a couple of things. 
David in, in 2 Samuel 24, 24 said this. Listen to me. He said this. And, you know, when I first heard this scripture, and I heard this scripture when I was about maybe, maybe 18, 19 years old. And I never, I never forget hearing this scripture. And it, and it was a scripture that had to do with David. Um, someone was offering David something to give as an offering. They were saying, David, you know, we know you're going to give an offering. Well, listen, take this and give it as an offering. And you know what David says? I will not take that from you. He says, because I will make no offering to God that costs me nothing. Oh, man. Ever since I heard that, I said to myself, man, I want to be like David. I don't want to give God leftovers. I don't want to give God afterthoughts. I want to give God the best that he can give me. And so, and so, and then there's another scripture that says in Psalms 116, 14, I will pay my vows to the Lord. By the way, whenever you give to God, whenever you give to a church that represents the Lord, always remember that you're not giving to a physical building. You're not giving to that pastor. You're not giving to those deacons. You're not giving to those ministers. You're giving to the Lord. And when you got that as a frame of mind, you know what? You're going to give, like the Bible says. God loves what kind of giver? Because you're giving to the Lord because he's the one who prospered you. He's the one who provided for you. He's the one that when, when, they, were ready to, when they were ready to reject you for that job, God just turned it around and boom, you had the job. You weren't supposed to get the job, but God turned it around. And so that's why, you know, in all my years at Brooklyn Tabernacle, you know, and, and I love my pastor. I mean, I love him dearly and all that. But I'm saying, but you know, when I gave, I always gave to the Lord. Because you know what? At the end of the day, it's not my pastor who kept me. It was the Lord that kept me. You know, when I was in college and I could have gone astray a million times. You know why I didn't go astray? Not so much because of my pastor, but because of the fact that the Lord was on my side. You know why I didn't take those drugs when they were offered to me? Because of the Lord was on my side. You know why I didn't take that alcoholic drink that they were, that were offering me? Because of the fact that the Lord was on my side. And so that's why we say that if it had not been, come on somebody, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? And so, and, the, and there's another scripture that I'm going to obey God and give to you in Psalms 50 verse 5. This is what my responsibility is. It says, in Psalms 50, verse 5, it says, gather, gather who? My saints together. I just finished doing the funeral this past Friday, and it was such a pleasure to do this funeral. Because you know what? I was just saying at the funeral that sometimes, you know, you have these people that you have to do a funeral for who are just evil people. I don't know how else to put it to you. They're just evil. They, they like to kill they like, to, they like to mug people. Uh, they're just mean to their own children. They're mean to their husbands or their wives. They're, 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 they're selfish. I mean, just mean people. But when you do the funeral, you know, they say you shouldn't talk bad about the dead. So you, so you have to say, you have to dance around the language so that, so that you don't offend the family. But you know, when I did this funeral, I didn't have to do that. Because I was talking about someone who was a saint in the Lord. Oh, man. It, took, it, it was such a pleasure. And that's what it says here. Gather my saints. How many here are saints? I hope you're not an ain't. <laughs> he says, gather them together to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by what? By sacrifice. And so, and so today, you know what? We're, we're going to celebrate exactly the way God intended us to celebrate. And this is how we celebrate. We're going to do just that. We're going to make a covenant with God by sacrifice. We're going to give to him sacrificially for how he has provided for us. But not just that. More importantly, for how he has provided for us as a church. You know, we, we have done things that even churches that are 15 times our size have never done. And you know why we do it? Because we have a mandate from the history of this church to do it. 
You know, uh, over the last two years, we gave over 40 some thousand dollars just to the poor, to the needy, to those who, and you know what? You did it. We did it together. You know, we, we gave over $73,000 towards a crusade just because we wanted to reach people for Christ. We didn't have to do that. We could have kept that for ourselves and put it towards this or put it towards that, a building or whatever else it might be. But you see, but it doesn't matter because we're under a mandate from the Lord. You see, when you do God's will, like Minister Kathy says, at some point God is going to do what he has to do. But it's a testing ground. It's a testing ground. And you're going to say, no, no. Well, then it's when it, now when it comes to your time, because that's what the Bible says. You know, God blesses those that bless him. The Bible says, give and what? It's amazing how we, you know, there used to be a prayer that people used to offer whenever, there was a, whenever they were praying for the offering. God bless those who give and those who what? Don't have to give. That ain't no scriptural prayer. <laughs> I don't know where, where people got that from, but I used to say it myself. Because <laughs> that's the way that, you know, people were taught to pray. No, the, the, the Bible says that give and it shall be given to you. And so, you know, it's like this. It's, it, you know, uh, now there are people who are unemployed. There are people who have, you really have no means. I'm not talking to you. You know, people who just are literally broke. I mean, they're, 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 their backs are against the wall. We're not talking to you. One day, God is going to deliver you. God is going to bless you so that you're not going to stay in that condition if you have a heart to give. And, but just like we would find a thousand dollars and we would find five hundred dollars and three hundred dollars and two hundred dollars and a hundred dollars and so on and so forth to get that cell phone to get that gucci handbag to get those those shoes that you've been looking at at the window for the last maybe year or so to get that outfit that furniture or, or to go or to travel go on vacation somewhere so god wants you to do the same thing and this is not a tithe, but it's a covenant sacrifice to the Lord. Now, before, now before we get to this, though, um, I want you to know that if, if, you, if you need a cell phone, now, you know, one of the things today that's critical to, to our current everyday living is a cell phone. There's, there's hardly anybody that I know that doesn't have a cell phone. Even little kids have cell phones because it's become... A natural way of life. And so when a cell phone breaks, people go crazy. They start losing their minds. Where is it? How did it? When can I get another one? And then they start calling. What's that? Assurian? Is, is, that's the name of the group. They, they, they start calling Assurian and say, please, please, please. How soon can you get it to me? Because, uh, and if not, you know what? They'll go out and find $500 and put down on that phone. Because that phone has become so critical to them. You know, like if you have a printer, those of you, you know, who work in, in, in the business world and, and work virtually from home, you know, you, your printer, if your printer goes out, you go out. And so, you know what, if the printer goes out, what you do, you're going to go out and find one. Yes, yeah, it's a 700, but it doesn't matter. You're going to find a way, put it on credit card, whatever it is, because you know what, that printer is essential to your business. And in order for you to keep your job for any length of time, you better make sure you get one that's actually working. Well... You know what? It's the same thing for us. It's we as a people, we, I mean, you know, it's funny. When I was at Brooklyn Tabernacle, we celebrated anniversaries. We celebrated milestones because I don't know how you, I don't know how you can belong to the church of the living God, be a part of the Ecclesia Carl, and not celebrate somewhere where God has brought people out of darkness into light where the word of God is preached and, and the worship is, is, is offered and, 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 and there's evangelism and there's fellowship. You know, and you know, fellowship means sharing something in common. Fellowship is not just, well, you know, I see Eon here and I say, how you doing? Hey, Bo. And, and that's it. No, it, it, it means that we share something in common. We share worship in common. We share the word in common. We evangelize. We share friendship together. That's what fellowship is. That's what, that's what the Bible says, that God has called us to fellowship. And so, and so, uh, uh, and so, if, you be, and so if you're a Christian, if you be, love the Lord, then you know what? That's the key, to be in a place where you can celebrate 
a particular moment, a particular time, a particular uh, organization, institution here on earth that was responsible for your salvation and the salvation of many others and also the salvation of many others that will come. You know that uh, over the last maybe month or so, we've had about six to eight people who've given their hearts to the Lord. You ought to celebrate that one. They've get right here, right here. They've cele we celebrate the fact that they've given their hearts to the Lord. And so I'm going to close with this scripture as we prepare to, as we prepare to give, as we prepare to, again, this is not tithes I'm asking. I'm asking you to do like the God, like the children of Israel did, and that is make a, a sacrifice to him. You know, you could do it this week, but definitely no later than, than next week. I want you to do it. And I want you to do it based upon the fact that it's you and the Lord. You know, whenever, whenever I would go to pastor's conferences, you know, pastor's conferences are very interesting because, you know, you have pastors in pastor's conferences who are these bishops and apostles and so on, and they have churches of like, you know, 3,000 and 4,000 and 5,000 people. And so when sometimes when they're, they're, they're making an appeal, they'll say, well, okay, we want, we want uh, churches who can to give $20,000 towards this crusade. You know, and, uh, and so we, I wasn't in that p position. I didn't have a church of three or 4,000 people. But you know what? But it didn't matter to me because I gave the best that I possibly could. So I would take $1,000. I would take $500. Because the one thing I, I was not going to do, I was not going to go to that conference and not give to the Lord for, for the fact that that conference, he brought that conference so that I could learn some things about the ministry. So because of that, I gave. I didn't give because of who was running the conference. I could care less who was running the conference. I gave because I said, Lord, thank you for this conference. And believe me, my wife can tell you, I, I've learned so much from these conferences. And so every time I went to a conference, I came back with, with, a, with, with a rich amount of information that helped our church to do the things that they were doing. But the point I'm making to you is never give out of compulsion the Bible says God doesn't want you to give out of compulsion or out of necessity. God wants you to give out of a cheerful heart. 